um, in the ultraviolet, what is the theory of everything in some sense. Um, and so the way we have in general been trying to do this is just to sit, undergo sort of a series of experiments, which we use to try to find all the new particles, like all everything that exists, and then how it interacts with each other. Right, that's basically what we would, at least what I would quantify as if we knew every, all the particles, knew all their interactions, I'd say we understood the sort of microscopic theory. And so the way people have been doing this traditionally, it's starting to change recently, but the traditional way is to just take everything, take some stuff, smash it together, and really utilize sort of Einstein's most famous equation, right, e equals mc squared. Because if you take enough energy and just shove it into a very small area, just by the two really nice things of quantum mechanics, where quantum mechanics says if something can happen, it will happen, maybe with a really small probability. But if it can happen, it will happen. And e equals mc squared means all you have to do for some, to have something amazing happen is to shove enough energy into it. And then something amazing can happen. So for example, like, if you take run the LHC long enough, there's a non-zero probability that let's say a unicorn or something will fly out of the collision. Of course, it's very, very unlikely, but if you have enough energy, it's a non-zero probability. And so this has sort of been the traditional approach to doing this. And it is great for studying the theory up to a certain energy scale, right? This E. And as soon as you don't have enough energy, you have to start making assumptions, right? Because if something is too heavy, too massive, we just can't create it. So if we can't produce the particles themselves, what we do is we sort of make assumptions about intervening physics. So we say, I understand the physics maybe at the atomic scale, and I want to understand it at the nuclear scale, uh, go to higher energies, let's say the nuclear scale. And if I can't actually directly probe it, what you do is you make some assumption about what goes on between the, where we can explore and where we, where we want to know. And you learn something about the sort of microscopic theory, the ultraviolet, modulo some assumptions. And the most famous example of this are grand unified theories, where we basically notice that, well, the strong interactions, the weak interactions, and the photons, sort of the electromagnetic interactions, all cross and have the exact same strength at some high energy scale. And we say, wow, this is a nice coincidence where three lines don't have to meet at a point. And so um, we sort of try to use this observation to um, understand the ultraviolet modulo quite a few assumptions. So if you sort of listen to what people in general, physicists in general are talking about today, you will hear a lot of talk about topology. And topology, and for a very good reason, right? Because Topology is something that's really hard to change, right? So if you take any theory, the most robust thing about that theory are the topological things about the theory. And in particular, a really nice statement you can make in at least these sort of microscopic theories is if you have something topological, it doesn't change between the microscopic theory and as you start going to larger scale. So it doesn't change under RG evolution. And so this means if you measure something topological about your theory, you can very directly um, measure something really intrinsic about your theory itself. So the sort of most classic example of topology is the Rahman of Bohm effect. And so, right, this is the standard thing. What you do is you take an electron, you move it around a uh, magnetic flux, right? You have some B field and in the process, the electron acquires a phase that's completely independent of the path, path you took to get there, the mass of the electron, or any of these things. And so this is a very nice topological object you can measure in your theory. And it's probably the first one any of us ever learned. Um, so what about the standard model? There are some topological objects um, in the standard model. Um, it, turn, there, it turns out there are three, one of which is unphysical, one of which is really hard to measure, and the other is confusing. So the first one is sort of the coupling, this topological coupling to photons, 
called theta ss tilde. And th what this guy does is it, well, it's unphysical unless monopoles exist. And what it actually does is it sort of tells you something about the electric charge of monopoles. Another one is a coupling to, well, a combination of SU2 and U1, which what it does is it tells you about baryon plus lepton number violation. And a somewhat annoying fact in terms of actually measuring this and doing anything with it is that it is exponentially suppressed. So it is there. In principle, you could learn something quite interesting out of it, but it is like it is really hard to measure this sort of that particular topological object. And the last one is called so the so-called strong CP problem, which is there is a topological interact uh, object associated with QCD, and it on for some reason or another, well, it plus a combination of other phases and whatnot has been measured to be very small. And so we don't really understand why it, it isn't really there. So these are the three things in the standard model. And as you can sort of expect, this is sort of the standard model, which means standard, it's well studied. And so people have looked at all this before. And so the question I wanted to ask is then, well, what if you are willing to add a new particle can there be new topological interactions that would teach you a lot about the standard model itself? And the answer is yes, there's actually one which to theorists have a sort of a classical name called to hoof anomalies. Um, but in the context of beyond the standard model particles, it's basically a scalar that couples to the scalar here is A, which couples to the photon FF tilde, just sort of like the angle, the topological guy theta. So in other words, what this field is doing is it's basically taking the topological parameter theta and making it dynamical a little bit. And so um, to, re to write this slightly more explicitly, what this is is a coupling between the axion and photon and the anomalous, so the sort of anomaly, the topological object. So the topological co object is usually called an anomaly here is this script alpha thing, or script A over here. There's some normalization parameters involving the coupling of photons and the coupling of the axion. This script A here is what carries topological information about the UV. And in particular, from the title of the talk, you might guess, have guessed that measuring this object um, anomaly, topological object, tells you about the fundamental value of electric charge. So it's actually a Millikan experiment, if we could ever measure this thing. And of course, this hasn't gone unnoticed. People have thought, like, would it be possible to measure this? And it turns out it is very hard if you think about this as a classical sort of um, scattering physicist. If you want to think of it using particles, it is really hard because there's this additional coupling F here, which is called the decay constant which does change as you go from high energy to low energy, or as you move around and do stuff. And so what you need to explicitly measure this sort of topological object, this um, anomaly, is you need something independent of F. And well, if you want to measure something topological, you do a topological experiment, right? You don't learn about Aronhoff bohm by just smacking electrons with photons or something. You learn around Aronhoff bohm by taking an electron and moving it around a uh, magnetic flux and doing some interference experiment. And so you do the same thing here. You have an object, that an axion, it couples to photons. Can we do something around kind of Bohm-like? And so the first thing is, well, you need to replace the magnetic flux with something. And you can ask, well, do strings have any, or do axions, this sort of coupling, a, this field A, have anything that acts like a flux? And the answer is yes, they do. This, this object is very much like an angle. And there exist strings around which this angle goes from 0 to 2 pi. And so it turns out um, that string objects exist for this axion. And if you take a photon and you go around this string, the photon acquires a phase. So in other words, there is an equivalent thing directly to, 
um, to Arahana of Bohm, where you replace magnetic flux with an axion string, and you replace the electron you're sort of probing it with, with a photon. And there's exactly analogous um, to the Arahana of Bohm, as long as you make those two replacements. And yeah, so photons acquire a phase, in particularly circular polarized photons, right? They're just like the phase an electron acquires depends on if it's a particle, antiparticle, et cetera, et cetera. The photons will depend on how it's polarized. And in this case, circular polarization is what you need. Okay, so the sort of interesting thing to note then is that if you have strings and you have this coupling to photons, there's a unique opportunity to sort of learn about this topological object called the Tuft anomaly. And the Tuft anomaly teaches you about the fundamental value of electric charge. So it's teaching you something about the ultraviolet, the fundamental theory that you can't necessarily access. Um, as someone who has only access to low energies. Okay, and you can even ask, do these things exist? And um, personally, I th find the sort of phenomenology, the sort of what appears so interesting by itself. I'm like, eh, who cares exactly how well motivated? It's just one new particle. But uh, for people who do care, string theory actually there have been many papers writing about how well motivated these things actually are. And in fact, fairly generically from string theory, you, you not only get one of these guys, you get many of these guys and they happen to be very, very light. Like in fact, many of the um, axions that people get from string theory are lighter than Hubble today. They're essentially massless. Okay, so an outline for the rest of my talk and people should feel free to interrupt me if they have questions, if I'm being unclear, just feel free to say something. Um, so the generic outline for the rest of the, uh, the talk is gonna be, I'm gonna sort of give you some basic review of string theory. Strings as in not the, the sort of quantum little um, quantum gravity type strings, but just like these cosmic strings, these sort of strings that you could literally walk out and look into the sky and see. Um, so some very basic review of that. I'll sort of go over the derivation of the, this Arahana Bohm effect of um, strings. And then I'll sort of start to say, well, once you have this, how would you look for it? And so it turns out the CMB is a really good way to look for these effects. Um, so sort of describe that. And finally, if I have time, I'll sort of go into the uh, slightly more uh, theory tangent and tell you why this Tehuft anomaly is actually teaching you about is a Millikan experiment. Why is it teaching you of, about electric charge? And in particular, for example, a value of this script A will have a value that's roughly schematically um, the charge, fundamental charge squared. So it's gonna be one if you think the electron has um, one charge is the fundamental. Okay, so the first thing is how do people believe strings form? It turns out there are a number of mechanisms, but in some sense, the easiest one is one that actually happens in the lab. So in the lab, if you take things, cool them down, you'll actually get topological defects through a mechanism called the Kibble mechanism. And so the Kibble mechanism, well, I guess in condensed matter, it's usually Kibble Zurich, um, but um, the way this mechanism works is if you go um, in the early universe, the universe was hot enough that this sort of um, angular variable, you have to treat it as an xy coordinate. You have to treat the radial direction in addition just to the angle itself. Then as you cool, you just automatically get strings. It's basically strings by random chance. And the way this works is that as you cool, you start off in the early universe where you're basically sitting at the origin and the angle theta is undefined. So it means nothing. And at some point you cool down and you leave the origin and you say, well, now I have to choose a, a value of theta to sit at. And because of causality, each Hubble patch chooses its own value of theta. It just randomly picks it. And so you'll get something like this where you have a zero, you have a two pi over two, you have a pi, a three pi over two. And if you just sort of wander around enough aimlessly, then by absolute random chance, you may go from zero all the way back to pi when going around as you traverse. 
And this is the definition of a string. A string is something around which when you go around it, this angular field, the axion, goes from 0 to 2 pi. And so this is the idea of how people um, do uh, believe that at least a very easy way to produce strings in the early universe is just by random chance. And in fact, this has been validated even in sort of condensed matter laboratories where you just take something, an analogous system, you heat it up and then cool it down. And there's a nice long theory where you can even predict how many there are and everything. And so that's sort of nice and fun. Um, so what do we need to know about it in the early universe? And it turns out we only need to know one thing. The one thing we need to know about it is that roughly speaking, the number of strings per Hubble volume is a constant. And this constant is called C, that's this thing here. And so if you told the value of C, basically what this is telling you is that there are C Hubble sized strings per Hubble patch. That's to zeroth order um, what it is. And it turns out that this sort of behavior of having C um, strings per Hubble patch is an attractive solution. It is, it, no matter what your starting condition is, it'll attractively go towards this solution. And it's called the scaling solution of strings. And so if it was exactly constant, this would be the, if C was exactly constant, the number of strings per Hubble patch is constant as Hubble is changing. This is the scaling solution. It turns out people have found that there are some logarithmic violations of this. And there are some arguments and discussion in the literature over what exactly the value should be. But to zeroth order, all that matters is you can say, in principle, we should know what this constant C is. In practice, what we can say is it's somewhere between one and a thousand. I'm trying to take a rather large window just to make it sort of to encompass everything. And so that, that's basically all you need to know about strings in the early universe, which is there are roughly a constant number of them per Hubble patch. And the, the constant number is anywhere between one and a thousand. OK, so that's basically all you need to know about the sort of strings and how they form and how they behave. So what about the signature, the, this Arahanov bohm effect I mentioned earlier? OK, so a tiny little bit of algebra. I'm going to sort of go over it fast. Um, you can ask, what is the behavior of photons in the background uh, with this coupling, right? If this angular variable A over F has some profile, how, does, how do photons change? And what you can do is you can calculate the dispersion relationship of the photon. And what you discover is that circularly polarized, right circularly polarized or left circularly polarized, clockwise or counterclockwise, they travel at slightly different phase velocities. And so if you've thought about this for a little bit, a slight difference in phase velocity um, will manifest itself like this thing here. And as you move, you acquire um, some amount of phase. So it's right, it's the integral of your velocity dt. And in this example, I took the simplification that the axion, this field is constant in space and just changing in time. It doesn't actually change the results. It just makes the math slightly easier. And what you'll notice is that you're integrating a total derivative which means by the fundamental theorem of calculus, it's sort of a topological like object that depends only on your initial and final positions. It doesn't care about what happened in between. And you'll notice that this phase that you get rotated, this um, sort of photon gets rotated, is proportional to the change, how much the angle changed. So very much like a Rachmaninoff bohm. And it has a magnitude that you'll notice proportional to this sort of anomaly, this sort of measurement of charge times the alpha E and M. OK, and so recall that it is completely analogous to the Rahman of Bohm if you used clockwise or counterclockwise polarized light. Replace electron with clockwise polarized light. Um, for any people who sort of think about C and B, I'm going to I have a quick apology slide, which is for in the CMB literature, people like to use alpha as the sort of polarization rotation angles. And for me, I'm going to be using phi. 
because alpha has already been taken by the electromagnetic coupling. And in fact, if the electron has unit charge, you can even write an equation alpha equals alpha, which is sort of amusing. Um, but to zeroth order, sort of uh, quick apologies for any of those who are more CMD inclined. Okay, so let's sort of describe in detail how Arachanov bohm type experiments are done in nature in this sense. So um, you have a string, which is an object where this angle, the field goes from zero to two pi as you go around, it goes from zero to two pi. And so you can construct an experiment exactly like um, you do in the lab, where you take a photon and you go around a string and you can ask, what is the polarization rotation you get? And so you can take the formula we had before, plug in two pi rotation, and you can see that the angular rotation, uh, the phase that you acquire is the anomaly times alpha E and M. And it turns out there's one slight difference, which is most light in nature is not circularly polarized. It's either unpolarized or it's linearly polarized. And so you can ask, what does how does circular polarization sort of rotation affect linearly polarized light? This has been done sort of a long time ago. People know that what the answer is, is it's a rotation of the linear polarization angle or the linearly polarized light. It's plane of rotation is sort of rotating. That's what sort of the difference in phases, this sort of birefringence phenomenon um, does. And so it's true that when you send circularly polarized light around a string, it'll acquire a phase. In practice, what you do is you send linearly polarized light. That means if it was polarized on the x-axis, you take it around. It's no longer polarized exactly on the x-axis. It's rotated a little bit and amount um, the anomaly times alpha E and M. So in nature, you tend not to have photons going in circles. That's a pretty rare phenomenon. Instead, what you have is something like light just passing by it. So you can ask if you have light passing by a string to the left, light passing by the string to the right, how do things change? And so on one side, it's going from zero to pi. On the other side, it's going from zero to minus pi. And so what you see is that these guys each get a slightly different rotation angle, but that the difference between the two is a full loop and it's the anomaly coefficient times alpha. So order of percent. Um, the other thing you do is sometimes the strings are not infinite. Sometimes it's a, the strings are in a loop. And so you can ask, well, what happens if the photon flying through goes through the loop or it misses the loop? And as you can probably guess, if you miss the loop, you started at zero, you end up back at zero. And so no phase rotation or linearly polarized um, rotation of the polarization angle is there. If you go through the string, then you actually go from zero to two pi. And what you see then is that you acquire the full sort of anomaly times alpha rotation angle. Plus or minus sign depends on how this string is oriented. Are you going from zero to two pi or zero to minus two pi? And so that's basically just everything you need to know about how strings sort of interact with photons. It's just, these are the, this previous one where light just shines past a string and a light shines through a string loop are just the two things that are most easily realized in nature. And so those are the two that you sort of need to keep in the back of your mind, which is, you either acquire a full phase or there's sort of a discontinuity, a jump as you sort of cross the string. Okay, so since we have sort of our Arachanov bohm signature, let's just look for it, right? What is the best way? And it turns out the string it, CMB is really nice, right? Because the CMB is basically a backlight of our universe, right? It's just constantly shining light from a huge distance away. And we're just sitting here observing it, seeing all the little wiggles as it passes by galaxies and all these gravitational effects and everything on its way to us. And in particular, if there are strings anywhere between us and the CMB, this photon would have passed by the string and acquired a rotation angle. And so you can then ask, great, we have a signal. We know how to look for it. The CMB is a linearly polarized source. Um, that has, and not only that, it's a nice one because we know what its polarization angle should be 
um, because we know how the polarization was generated, right? The polarization was generated by Thompson scattering. And so if you see a quadrupole in the side, you know, be like, I know exactly what the physics creating the polarization is. I know exactly what direction it should point. And so you can see polarization angles um, and the, their rotations um, by looking at the CMB. And so you can then ask, okay, what is the best way to look for this effect? And it turns out there are two effects that you can look for. The first is sort of a very traditional thing that everyone in the CMB does, which is a power spectrum analysis. They take two point functions, they Fourier transform it, and then give you the result. That's sort of the standard way of doing basically studying everything in the CMB. Uh, the these are the famous CLs of the temperature temperature correlators. Uh, the other thing though is saying, well, the standard analysis is looking in Fourier space. But a, an interesting thing that I sort of mentioned before is that as you cross the string, there's a jump, there's a discontinuity in the polarization rotation angle. And so they're actually, aside from these sort of more um, Fourier transformed versions, there are actually um, features in physical space that you can look for. You can just look for literally, look at the polarization, and then, oh, there's a discontinuity. And then you can be like, oh, that, if I can track it along a whole line in the sky, that's, an, that's a string. So there are two basic ways to look for it in momentum space and in position space, or in L space and angular space. So it turns out it is really difficult to do this exactly correctly, in part because it's really difficult to simulate numerically. So numerically, what would you do? Best case, you would take the CMB, take a bunch of numerical simulations of how axion, uh, axion strings behave between them and now, shine light through it, and just add up the polarization rotation angle, repeat it on many times to just understand statistically what, sh what should things look like right where we are. It turns out that it is really difficult to simulate that many E foldings because just there's a huge difference in scales. And so uh, also the fact is none of us were numerical people when we were working on this. And so what we did was we tried to do sort of a toy analytic approach and then a toy numerical approach to sort of see what do we generically expect to happen. And so what you can do is then again, two point functions. You can look at a two point function, a two point correlator of the polarization rotation ang angle. And what you can do is what we did was the, the toy part is we just pretended that the strings were all Hubble sized loops of random orientations. Uh, in particular, we assume them to be circles randomly oriented. And if you pass through them, you acquire a, the full rotation phase. And you just integrate over all directions and all orientations. So you can go through, do this analytically. It's a horrendous formula that you don't really need to care about. That depends on the number of strings at any redshift. Make sure things are correlated. If they both go through the string uh, loop, it's yada, yada, yada. Um, but there's actually one piece where you do get a sort of physical intuition which is the um, variance at a single point. And the statement is, what's happening is that single point as it comes to us, it is going through lots of loops whose signs are sort of random. So this is a random walk process. And so what you do is you can go through the math, math and you do indeed find the standard um, sort of random walk behavior. The number of steps or the number of loops times, or the variance is equal to the number of steps times the step size squared or you can square root that to get the familiar step size times square root of n sort of scaling behavior. And so you sort of reproduce that. That's sort of the one limit where you have a, even not just a good analytic approach, but a good sort of intuitive approach for what's going on. Um, what we did is we wanted to compare this sort of toy analytics that we did with some toy numerical simulations. Again, like I said, it'd be, the best thing to do is just numerically simulate the full axion strings. Uh, most well, we can't even, uh, we are not particularly numerically ca capable, but even those who are find it very difficult to do these simulations and they sort of disagree with each other on what the answer is. And so what we did to do a toy numerical simulation is we just randomly threw down strings, infinitely long straight strings. So you'll notice we treated the strings very differently than we did before. Before we said the strings were all in the form of Hubble sized loops. Now we're saying every string is in infinitely long strings. And then as time goes by, 
we, you have to remove strings to maintain the sort of C strings per Hubble patch scaling. And so then you just take this sort of toy numerical simulation with just infinitely long sh straight strings thrown at complete random. And then you trace CMB photons through that. And so that's what we did for various values of C. So you'll notice the, if there are 100, you get some very nice um, sort of behavior here. It, um, as you go to the C of 10, you'll notice, start noticing like right here, you start seeing these sort of line-like features. By I, you can start seeing the sort of step sizes I was mentioning before, like when you cross an individual string. And in the case of C equals one, so one string per Hubble patch, you can look at this and just be like, wow, I see sort of discrete jumps all over the place. Obviously the best thing to do at this point in time is not to Fourier transform it, but look for this in position space or angular variable space. Um, so what you can do is then compare this sort of toy simulation and the toy analytics, the two point function, and what you find is that they actually agree very well on small angular scales, despite treating the strings extremely, extremely differently, right? Like if one was treating them as loops, the other as infinitely long straight strings. And so what you have here is the two point function normalized to the random walk, right? The number of strings times the step size. And in black line, we have the theory and in these sort of dashed red, uh, blue, and orange, you sort of have the simulations for different number of strings per Hubble patch. You see that the different number of strings agrees up to the rescaling of the random walk, so that's nice. And that there's some largest cosmic variance that you get. And so you see that the black line and these dashed lines agree quite well uh, until you get to large angular scales which are when you can actually resolve, is the string actually an infinitely long straight line or is it a big loop? And at this point, we don't know which one is a better um, thing. We should, you actually need proper numerical simulations than our sort of toy thing. But the fact that they agree at large angles or small angles is sort of, we find encouraging because it seems to indicate it doesn't matter how you treat the strings, like what is their exact shape or anything. Okay, so how, do, so how does the sort of CMB actually look for this particular two-point function? And the way it does that is that what polarization rotation does is it turns E modes into B modes. And so in particular, um, there are some nice things about this because there are other effects that turn E modes into B modes. Um, like, but in this case, it's actually a nice one because it's frequency independent. It's changing everything the same way. So you can use this to sort of um, kick out, get rid of backgrounds. Um, and so in slightly more precise or descriptive, what do I mean by E and B modes, et cetera, is what you do is you take the Stokes parameters at every point on the sky, right? The Qs and the Us. So basically the amplitudes and then the angles of how it's linearly polarized. Um, and you can ask, how do these guys change when you do a polarization rotation angle? The sort of what you measure is a vector without a head, right? So it's a spin two object, right? Because you flip it 180 degrees, you're back to yourself. So that says you're spin two. And so that means it rotates like twice the polarization rotation angle. And what people do is then they take these Q and U's and they Fourier transform it. Uh, and well, because it's, a sphere that's slightly more complicated than your typical Fourier transform, but morally speaking, all they're doing is Fourier transforming it. And the E modes are these sort of divergence modes I drew back here, right there, these divergence modes. And the B modes are the curl modes and are the imaginary part of the Fourier transform. And so um, you can go through a lot of algebra. It's not particularly enlightening. What you find is that sort of the B modes are proportional to the E modes under a polarization rotation angle using a bunch of Klebsch-Gordon coefficient type things. And as any CMB person likes to do, they build optimal estimators, sort of the best way to um, pick out information from your data. And people have done this for us. And what they've done is sort of found, let's see, a plot. They've made a plot like this, which basically tells you what's the two point function, the CLs as a function of L. And so what these other nice people have done for me, or for everyone, 
is that they've sort of estimated what is the Planck bound on various CL modes. And then they sort of plotted the future sensitivity of experiments in just light birds and simons, which should be on fairly soon, like five years or something, versus sort of more ambitious long-term projects, let's say like CMB stage four or PICO. And what we did then is just, well, let's take our numerical simulations and sort of plot the lines on top. And you can see that if the anomaly coefficient is one and there are a large number of strings per Hubble patch, you're actually already fairly sensitive to it, right? If there are order 100 strings per Hubble patch and an anomaly coefficient of one, so electron fundamental value of charge, um, it would be excluded. Whereas if you only had of order one string per Hubble patch, it's actually just right at current sensitivity. And remember, we didn't trust our results necessarily at low Ls. Um, of course, it's possible that the anomaly coefficient is slightly smaller. Maybe the down quark, charge one third, is the fundamental value of electric charge. And then you'd see that this is charge squared. It's um, one ninth. And you can see that we basically aren't really sensitive to it yet. But in the time scale of 10 years, let's say, when you get to these really future um, 10 year future um, sort of telescope programs, then you would be sensitive to it. So this is something that like even sort of the reasonable values you would expect to sort of have a theory prior that the fundamental value of electric charge is one or one third. And these would all be visible if there were strings around. Okay, um, let's skip the power spectrum. So another way to look for these things is sort of an edge detection. So this is um, one of the, what I find is one of the coolest ways to do it because this is actually something that's not being currently done, which or at least as a theorist makes me a lot more excited. Like, oh, if they're not doing it, then maybe you should start doing it. There'd be a new search or something to do. And the statement is, well, if you take one of those polarization maps I drew and you just sort of zoom in on it, what you can see that is as you move, there are these jumps uh, as you sort of move across these lines, the axion strings. And so, well, you, they, there are a lot of edge detection um, algorithms. And so let's just apply an edge detection algorithm to it. Um, I can't show you exact results yet because this is work in progress. Um, but, um, what you see is that um, if you want to do a position space search, there are two important parts. One is you want good angular resolution so that you can sort of see each resolve each of these jumps, right? You don't want to like have five jumps in your angular resolution because then it no longer looks like the same size quantized jump every time. The other thing you want to do is you want to have good accuracy because so that you can see smaller and smaller jumps. And it's nice for this because you don't need a full sky coverage for this, right? If there's a string, it, you just need to be looking at, at it, have one string in your field of view, and then you can find it. You don't need like a full sky survey or anything like that. And so there are quite a few experiments, BICEP, PEC, SPT, Polar Bear, et cetera, et cetera, that have pretty good angular resolution of order arc minute and pretty good accuracy. They can sort of measure polarizations up to a percent. Um, and so another thing I sort of like about this sort of edge detection approach is that let's say there were strings around before inflation. And so only now is like one or two strings starting to come back into our horizon. So if there's only one or two strings in our entire universe, the best way to find it is to look for these position space information. You don't Fourier transform and lose this sort of localized information. And so it's sort of these sort of edge detection algorithms are really nice. Um, because that would be our chance of testing these sort of um, pre-inflationary physics type scenarios. And I had said it wasn't being done. And so people have done edge detection in the CMB, but what they do it for is in the temperature map. They, they look at temperature, temperature correlators. And you'll notice that this thing, all it did was just like how Arahan of Bohm doesn't affect the energy of your electron or anything. It just adds a phase. This thing again, does not affect the temperature or anything of your photons. All it does is change your polarization. And so these edges are only visible in your polarization data. Not, well, not real, they don't need to be visible in your temperature 
data. And so people have, um, it's possible that people have been looking in the wrong place. Um, okay, so finally, I'm just sort of gonna mention one last way to look at it more in the current universe, which is there are things called quasars, which are very bright sources that are order cosmological distance away. And we have seen quite a few lensed quasars, right? So what a lensed quasar does is we see multiple images, which means we are literally seeing a loop of photons, right? The ones that come from up here have traveled this particular side of the loop. And the ones that appear down here have traveled this side of the loop. And so that means that these two images of the quasar, if there's a string in between them, their polarizations are off by a small amount, right? Of order anomaly times alpha, so order percent. And so you can then just say, well, is it possible to um, use quasars to look for it? And so we've seen about 200 lensed quasars with a rather large right, angular um, diameter um, angle between the two sort of images. And so you can calculate what's the probability that a string is there in any of these 200 lens quasars. And what you find is that the, if there are about 100 um, strings in our Hubble patch, then there's about a 10 to the minus three probability. So you have 100 quasars, that's about a 0.1 probability. So, well, we could get lucky, but Maybe if we saw something in the CMB, then you could try to look for a quasar that happens to be overlapping or near that string. Okay, so um, before sort of moving on and concluding, sort of I wanted to emphasize one sort of neat thing, which is people have thought about strings before, right? The, the strings are not a new thing. And in fact, strings in the CMB are not even new. People have looked for strings in the CMB before. And for them, the most relevant thing is the tension of the string, or in this case, what we call the FA, the sort of axion decay constant. And uh, this should be one over FA. Whoops. That should be one over FA. Um, but you look at this, the sort of constraints that the CMB places. They place constraints on the strings. And basically, that it's F. It, it cannot be larger than about 10 to the 14 GB or so. And our constraints are completely independent of the decay constant, right? Just like how Arachnov Bohm is independent of the mass of the electron, Arachnov Bohm like effects here are independent of the mass of the string. So everyone who's been looking for gravitational effects are really sensitive to the mass of the string, whereas we're just more sensitive to its um, coupling to photons. And so sort of the way people normally do this is they look for the deficit angle, right? If you have a massive string, there's a deficit angle around it. Angles don't go from zero to two pi, they go from zero to two pi minus a little bit, which depends on its mass. And so people have been looking for this sort of in the temperature map and placed uh, a bound that the G times the tension is about 10 to the minus seven or smaller. And again, ours are not sensitive this, to this at all. So any, all of the parameter space that's allowed can be probed. It's just a completely separate axis. So what do sort of the um, constraints look like? Well, in principle, just like how the um, temperature and isotropies depend only on the mass, this should depend in principle only on the anomaly coefficient, the sort of coupling to photons. And in practice, it depends on two variables, the number of strings per Hubble patch in this. In principle, our numerical colleagues could tell, would one day tell me, I believe there, it should be 100. And then I just put a line through here, 100, and then that's that. Um, but what you can do then is just ask, what do constraints look like on this plot? Um, so here are the sort of CMB plot um, constraints or sort of projected constraints. We still have to do the Planck 2015 analysis exactly correctly. Right now, it's just more of a quantitative or qualitative estimate. Um, sort of quasars are good if there's a very large number of strings and a large anomaly coefficient. Edge detection, we're unsure of how sensitive it is exactly. Could go all the way down here, maybe over here, up there. We're not sure yet, but it can go to it is most sensitive when there are not a large number of strings per Hubble patch. Um, 
Okay, so finally, before concluding, I just wanted to dive um, slightly more into theory land a little bit. Just as a theorist, this is some of the stuff I like sometimes. In particular, I wanna um, argue that this coefficient A here is, um, is in some sense a measurement of the fundamental value of electric charge. Okay, so why is this also, aside from being a cool new signature that isn't being looked for, why is this also a Millikan experiment? Okay, um, so a little bit of theory here. So this angular variable, um, well, physics right, should always be the same at zero and at two pi, which means if you have an angular variable, it's also equal to itself at zero to at two pi. And you'll notice, that if I look at this particular coupling here, right, the, whoops, um, this particular coupling here, it is not invariant. It, it changes as you go from zero to two pi, right? Like this is not a sine or a cosine. And so what this means is that this topological, this topological parameter of the standard model, this data must have a period of at, at least two pi times the anomaly coefficient here, right? So as A over S goes from zero to two pi, physics at theta equals its value or, or theta equals two pi times the anomaly coefficient must be the same. And so what does this periodicity of this top standard model topological object tell us? Well, as I mentioned before, this thing is unphysical unless there are monopoles around. And there's an effect called the Witten effect, which is that if you take a monopole and you put it um, in your just sitting at the origin or something, in the presence of this topological parameter, it acquires an electric charge. An electric charge that is roughly speaking, um, theta times electric charge squared over the minimum value. And so as theta goes from zero to two pi, you'll notice the monopole changes electric charge, right? The theory doesn't, the monopole doesn't go back to itself. And so the only way that this can be a symmetry of your theory is if there are an infinite number of monopoles and as theta goes from zero to two pi, you take a charge zero monopole, turn it into a charge one monopole, take a charge one monopole, turn it into charge two, two to three, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And in fact, this is exactly what you find in these sort of UV completions, sort of more complete theories of the universe is that there are an infinite tower of monopoles and the periodicity of theta tells you the, the difference in electric charge of the monopoles. And so that means if you had a charge zero monopole, you can tell, I can tell you what is the charge of the next monopole in the spectrum. I can tell you the difference in charge between monopoles. And if you assume that this difference in charge is just the fundamental value, then what you see is that this anomaly coefficient is just equal to the fundamental value of the electric charge squared. So, but more generally, you'll notice I said I made an assumption, which is that the difference in electric charge was equal to the E min and not just like two times it or three times it. So the slight caveat is what you can prove without any assumptions is that this anomaly coefficient is an integer times the fundamental value of electric charge squared. Which you also get if you try to do some model building too. But it's nice that you can see this even from the bottom up from you don't need sort of to UV complete this and tell you what the theory of the axion is. I just know it from first principles. And so for example, if we measured a fractional anomaly, we measured like one over 25, let's say, then right away we know, even though there's this ambiguity Z, we know that one, the electron does not have the fundamental value of electric charge. In fact, the down quark doesn't even have the fundamental value of one electric charge because one over 25 is not an integer times one third squared. And so you immediately learn, maybe not you exactly what the value of the fundamental charge is, but you can pretty darn well measure sort of the, um, get a lot of information about it. And so to me, that's super exciting. Um, and so to sort of conclude, sort of I strings this and their coupling to photons are in some sense sort of like a match made in heaven. These arachnov bohm type effects are topological. And so they tell you really fundamental stuff about your theory of the universe, not just the theory of the axion. You learn theory about the theory of the standard model itself. And it's really nice because 
there are sort of like multiple ways to look for it. There's sort of power spectrums that people um, are doing. And right now we're sort of at the edge of sensitivity. In fact, there are even um, papers that are sort of coming and going that are saying that they're measuring non-zero polarization rotations in the CMB at the order of 1%. So at the order of A equals one. Um, another thing is that there are these sort of edges in the CMB. And so you can try to apply new techniques, sort of like edge detection that are not being done. And it'd be kind of exciting if there was actually something in the CMB. And so finally, there are even other double checks you can try to do um, in the real world, sort of using, or current world, sort of using quasars. But you'd have to get kind of lucky to use them. All right, thanks a lot. Thanks to you. And uh, there will be clip, virtual clip, clapping, mm -hmm. probably. <laughs> well, thanks a lot for the nice talk. I uh, don't know if there are questions or comments. Please uh, just unmute your microphone and speak up. Uh, hello, I have a question. Yeah. Are there foregrounds for these uh, signals? Yeah, so there's some annoyance um, in dealing with this. So like there's effects, um, for example, uh, Faraday rotation and things like that, which can, which will also cause polarization rotations. Um, those, are, those are typically frequency dependent and so um, people think that they can probably remove those types of ones. There's annoy other annoyances such as the polarization of the CMB was not generated entirely at the CMB, but also at reionization. And so that, that's the second component that's in there that also sees different rotations because it was formed later. Um, what else are there? Um, Okay, those are sort of ones that I can think of right now. I guess edge detection, you'll have issues of making sure it's not instrumental noise because if you resolve, go too far in, obviously you'll be dominated by random noise. Um, yeah, so, so there are some things you have to get around, which is why we're sort of trying to, well, we're not doing it ourselves. We're in some sense being like cheerleaders for some actual proper CMB stage four scientists to go sort of do this. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah. thank you. Any other, any other question or comment? Uh, yes, maybe me. Uh, hi, I'm uh, Jan Gutenberg. I'm from Desi in Hamburg. Uh, I think it's quite interesting that uh, your constraint does not depend on the string tension. Yeah, it's, it's really surprising well well we were first doing like afterwards it's obvious but like before then we were like oh that's really surprising because that's everyone looks for it depending on the string tension and here it's just more like it's just a completely separate direction and so wow. yeah it's i see and uh, have you thought about uh, um, constraining uh, other type of string outside the action actionic one um We've started to look a little bit, but it is not as easy to get, like these sort of Arahana boom type things are not common, I guess. It's sort of not the most. And so there are other things you can try to do like sort of gravitational waves, like anyone who does nanograv these days will see a million and one papers on that sort of stuff. Um, but it's, yeah, I, we haven't found anything analogous to the sort of effect in sort of non-axion strings. So for example, there are like, these are global strings is another thing people will type, sometimes call them. And so for local strings, I don't think there's quite an analogous effect, but there can be sort of other effects. For local string, it is a charged particle that acquire a phase when they pass through a string, right? Yeah. But not the photon itself. Well, yeah, see so a Robin, a Robin of bon effect for the photon itself, not for the charge particle. Yeah, that's right. It, it's kind yeah. of an odd one because this is not really saying, like in some sense, the analogy is very nice, but then also it's like, well, the photon doesn't have charge. This is in some way of saying that this photon is charged 
under the axion. I see. And so, and you're measuring how charged is the photon under the axion. It's, yeah. And a lot of the other ways of sort of measuring this sort of fake charge depends on things like the, like the string tension and whatnot, which then sort of complicates stuff. But this particular way of measuring it doesn't depend on mass, the tension or anything, just because you're trying to measure something topological. So you want to do a topological experiment instead. I see. It's quite interesting. And do you have the time scale for the the future experiments that could exclude the the uh, anomaly coefficient a? Yeah. So the minus two. Um. So the main. Whoops. Where is some? Let's say here we go. Um. So these Lightbirds and Simons are sort of on the five-year time scale. And sort of the CMB stage four and Pico are more on the 10 year time scale. I think those are, these are, and so it's, well, I'm, I'm used to the LHC time scale. So this seems to me very fast. Um, and well, I guess data analysis sometimes takes some time, but yeah, th these are sort of five for short term gains and well, short term still like one or two orders of magnitude. And then um, 10 years for these more longer term ones. I see. So it means in uh, yeah in ten years uh, maybe action string are excluded. Yeah, no. at, at least one any ones that exist after the CMB. I see. Yeah, you could you could just be like yeah they're basically not going to be around. You have to look at other types of strings, local strings or something like that. It, it's actually super surprising to me that it's like why is it right now at the edge of sensitivity? Right. It's like like some of these plots like here. Right. Why why is it now that it are just starting to be sensitive, that's a complete random chance, and which I guess makes it actually exciting for me, but it's like just got lucky in some sense. Usually for these things, they're either way excluded or you'll never see them type things. I see. And uh, so usually, so here normally when the axion get the mass, the, the string network gets uh, destroyed, right? Yeah, so what happens is you would say if it got a mass, let's say its mass was equal to Hubble at uh, a few E foldings after the CMB, you'd start going through a few um, sort of string loops. And then at some point, all the strings just disappear. And so you need so to assume a very light axion. Hmm? You need to assume a very light axion. Yes, so that's what right. Are, what, what, what are the typical masses that you uh, assume? Let's see. It's great. Um, I have a bound here. Um, so I see. It's lighter than 10 to the minus 15 to get any sort of signal at all, minus 15 EV, and all the way down to however light you want, sort of. I think this is more like Hubble today. Um, one way to sort of make things disappear or not disappear is if you have domain walls. Um, because if you have two domain walls per string, then the string is being pulled in two opposite directions and you don't, your sort of string network doesn't actually vanish. But then you have to be very careful that you don't overclose the universe. So there's still a bound on the mass, even in that case, when you don't have domain wall number equal to one. The vertical axis, is it F or one over F? Uh, one over F, sorry, I so, mislabeled this. And so what is a red and blue regions? Uh, so red is where the CMB has excluded you. Oh, okay. So the way CMB looks for strings is sort of these deficit angles as the string is moving through the sky, creates some effect on the temperature anisotropies. Here, this blue line is just overclosing the universe. So I think Zeldovich or something did it a long time ago. And so if you're anywhere down here, you would just, and you have domain wall number more than one, you would overclose the universe. I see. And so in some sense over here, you say, this is basically the heaviest direction could ever be in this, in order to have um, relevant sort of string phenomenology. So it is quite light, yes. It's, it's for example, not the QCD axion. And uh, you, so here you assume that the, the energy scale at which the domain wall are formed is given by a relation between F and MA as for QCD. Uh, no, so here we're just treating them completely separately. If, if they're related by QCD, there'd just be a line on here. Well, 
it missed the plot. The QCD line would be way over there. That's in the way excluded region. Okay. Yeah. So this is very much not the QCD axion. So the then what because I guess the constraint on the domain wall over closure depends when the domain wall when the domain walls form, right? Form, yes. And so it depends quite sensitively on the mass because they form when Hubble equals the mass roughly. I see, I see, I see. Okay. Thank you. Uh, thanks a lot for the questions and the answers. And uh, I think that uh, we can close the, the talk. Thanks uh, again, Anson, for the very nice talk and for the answers. Yep. And happy to uh, be here. Uh, let's uh, stay the moment after that we finish the, the talk. Uh, just to give you information. So thanks, everybody. Thank you.